The thinking, language, and practice of a person-centered approach to supporting people with disabilities emerged in the 1970s, along with the process of deinstitutionalization. Forty years later, we face great challenges in our efforts to remain faithful to the intent and spirit of work that honors the citizenship of all and builds a beloved community that works for everyone. And so we gathered to reflect on influences, actions, and learnings that have emerged through lifetimes of commitment to a just world that is built upon the contributions of all. being involved in thinking about ideals, being ideal seeking, is that from the very beginning it always involved organizational change. Like you never separated thinking more about what was possible for people, which has now become person-centered planning. You never separated that from changing the way we did, we did our work in order to make the support we were offering for people more fruitful. And our job was to go to the various institutions in the state, identify people or have the hospital would identify people to move, find a place in the community for them to live, move them in and be of there to support over time. I'd never done anything like this before in my life, but it was really fascinating. And looking back on it now, again, just kind of blows my mind sometimes. Um, I was one of 14 or 15 people in the entire state of Georgia. We had a number of counties that we were responsible for. And each of us was only the one person in each of these regions. So I would go, say, to Central State Hospital, which at one time was the largest institution in the world, meet with staff and find out who might be ready, uh, might be able to go. The thing that's so amazing to me today, as I think back about that 18 months that I worked in that program, was that in 18 months, I moved 38 people into family homes. So there's a lot about this that's imperfect, but at the time, into family homes where they would be part of a, of a family. We had to do everything. We had to meet the people, go find a place in the community, get a home inspected, have everything checked, actually pick the people up at the institution and take them to where they were going to be living, and uh, then back and visit to make sure things were going okay. Out of the 38 people that I moved, by the time I left, not one person failed. Everybody was successful in living there. And that includes some people that I remember specifically. Uh, there were two men who moved into the same family home who had been at Central State Hospital for 50 years each. And when I picked them up to take them to where they were going to be living, they were like this, didn't look up, bent over, just, but you, you could hardly see them. So I got them to the place where they were going to be living, went back two weeks later, and when I rang the doorbell, they met me at the door standing up like this. And in two weeks, they just seemed like they'd been transformed people from living at Central State and living with the family. And then there's one other woman that I remember who was, um, had some kind of mental health issue, moved in with another woman. And shortly after she moved in, the, the woman she was living with got very, very sick. And this woman, who had been institutionalized for over 20 years, was not supposed to be able to do anything, totally took care of the woman she was living with until she recuperated. And then went back to not doing very much, which I think is one example which shows the power of being needed and like rising to the occasion. And when it's not there, things just went back the other way. So it's, it's very powerful to me to remember that time because I wasn't any expert uh, in anything, was given the job, people in the institutions were very supportive and very cooperative, and we just did it. And when I ask myself today, how many people does it take to move 38 people? How long does it take? How much does it cost these days to do what, not just me, but the other people who were doing the same job in Georgia did? and had that many people be able to move out of a, an institution into some type of uh, ordinary home in the community. Uh, 
I had been assigned to a rural community in Georgia, Fitzgerald, Georgia, and had walked into one of these day programs, which was funded through the block grants in those days, where everybody with disabilities was thrown together, usually in an old school that had usually been an old black school that had mo most recently been abandoned in the service of desegregation. And um, that was where I landed to try to work toward a higher possibility for community and for a group of people, uh, which in that case were people with disabilities of all ages, because that was before 94142, uh, before kids were in school. And everybody, whether they were babies or school age kids or old people, were all just thrown together in these programs. So I spent several years there trying to build with my with my friend Julie, build this school into something that was really more meaningful than just a place to throw people, because that's kind of how it was, that's kind of how it felt when I first went there. Uh, we did a lot of things. We brought in a lot of programming and a lot of great teaching and good behavioral, this and that, and a much more of an emphasis on engagement, it, real experiences of some sort or another. But then, um, we had a pass evaluation of that program. It was the first pass evaluation in Georgia, and that's where I met um, Connie and John. They were um, in the team leaders. At the time, I was student teaching in the local school, but I came to this feedback uh, in the evening, and I was all full of expectation that it was just going to be great. My friend and I and so many of the people at the training center, we put so much into building this program. Uh, for anybody who knows anything about a pass assessment, um, it was just your worst nightmare. <laughs> you know, that it was just kind of one sobering <laughs> confrontation with how really terrible the situation actually was uh, when it came to changing what was possible for the people who used this program. So in a couple of hours, I went from thinking I had been very clever uh, for quite some time to thinking and really understanding that as much as it was hard to hear the feedback that, in fact, our program was completely segregated, that we had unbelievably low expectations for people, that we were living out all of the ways that we could possibly continue to devalue people in spite of our best efforts. It was just a complete turning point for me to get that they were right. And we really needed to do something completely different if we were going to be making the difference that we believed was possible. Yep. Part of what was characteristic in those times, that was in 1976, is that you could receive feedback like that and let it in. And Philip J., who was the director of the program at the time, decided, we decided sometime within a couple of weeks of that feedback to take the whole program apart. And I spent the summer working with people to write a plan to take that training center apart. So here was a program that was only about three years yes, old, but then with feedback that was powerful, helpful in terms of thinking differently about what was possible, we could also imagine within a really short period of time, we could just do it. We didn't have to wait. We didn't, we could just use our own compass about what made sense to do to say, we can completely redesign this um, and think differently about what's possible for people. And got a job at the Georgia Mental Health Institute. It was a psychiatric hospital, but this unit was specifically for people with developmental disabilities. And shortly after I started working there, um, John came to be the director. He got us involved with PASS and thinking about the things that we were doing in a different way. We actually did a PASS assessment on the place that we all worked, and we decided that it had to be closed. So we literally closed down this unit. We all lost our jobs. People talk a lot now about doing yourself out of a job. Well, we all lost our jobs. And I took a job with the state art. It was also very interesting that after this happened and we closed the place, that about 10 years ago, John and I were on an airplane. And down the aisle of the plane comes one of the men that had been in that unit in 1975 and 76, going on a trip to Seattle. But we learned a lot 
by doing that pass assessment and we deciding, those of us who worked there, that we were willing to lose our jobs in order to help people have a better life um, in the community. And I was able to use the work I had done in family care to help people find locations and places to live which seemed to fit uh, what they were interested in and where they wanted to live.